<laughs> this lesson, this lesson is dedicated to Austin. Amen. Believe it or not, next Sunday is Austin's last Sunday in Miami. No, it's not time to celebrate. Gosh. <laughs> Just kidding, bro. We love you a lot. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, as we come to you today as family, I pray with all my heart that you would help us to honor you. As we come to you as family, Father, sometimes we're disobedient kids. Sometimes we're rebellious and prideful and we think we have all the answers and then we remember you. Father, I pray that today we can remember you. That we can know you just a little bit better. Father, that it would change our hearts. That it would change us into different people and help us to fight for our family. Father, I pray that you would speak through me today, that you would help every one of us to listen to your word. And Father, whether I mumble and fumble around with what needs to be said, I pray that the message gets across and our hearts are attentive. Amen. God, thank you for this time to get into your word. I pray for the victory with missions, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, man. Turn over in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 1. Oh, yeah. You know, as I begin the lesson right now, I do not know where we're at with missions. But I have a sneaking suspicion. <laughs> Nehemiah is such a great book. The story of what they did in his time is extraordinary. You need to understand that the walls of Jerusalem were built many, many years before. As a matter of fact, David conquered Salem, or eventually it was called Jerusalem. And it became the city of David, the city on a hill, a city that's a light to the rest of the world. When the Israelites were doing God's will and when there were righteous and godly leaders, it was the place to go to worship God. It was the place to go to see victories happen. It was the place to focus on when you're praying even because you knew God, His presence would be there. Amen. Over time, because of the disobedience of the Israelites, that hard-heartedness, the idolatry, the lack of leadership, the lack of faith, the lack of heart to do God's will, but to lust after and long after the world, God said, it's time to repent. So he sent prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet, and the people refused to turn back to God. Wow. It was a sad time, a dark time. They're in exile because of their sins. Anytime the kingdom of God was not advancing numerically and geographically, it was because God was against them. He opposed them because their sin had to have him turn his face from them because in God there is no darkness at all. When a church is getting smaller, God is opposing. When a church is not expanding geographically, God is opposing. He's opposing. He's exposing. And he's trying to help us get the picture and he'll send prophet after prophet because he loves his people. Finally, it's time for the Israelites to go back. They go back. They begin building the temple. And then now Nehemiah finds that the wall is just in ruins. Wow. Imagine you go home after church today and you drive up to your house. and You're like, wait, what happened? Wow. And the gate around your apartment complex has been burnt down. There's just piles of rubble and burning, smoldering wood, what used to be a gate around your place. And you look up at your building. You go, wait, where's my building? It's gone. What happened? What happened? And you begin to examine your heart. And you go, wait a minute. I've been so far from God. I started turning to the world. I started looking for my place of, that I live as my comfort and my security. I started looking to things of the world, physical things, and turned my heart from God. My job became more important. My family became more important than God. And the truth is, I think God opposed me. You've got no place to live. Your house is torn down. And you don't just go on with life. Like, oh, well. At this moment, this is what happens to Nehemiah in chapter 1. 
In verse 3 it says, They said to me, Those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. So they had gone back, they began to build a temple, but they're in trouble and they're in disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. This is the city on a hill. This is the city of God's people. It's their home. It's their heart. When Israel was great, Jerusalem was great. And God's presence was with them. With the wall torn down, he just says, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer. Your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. You know, the last couple of weeks I've noticed that day after day, night after night, I see post after post of people praying and begging God that we can rebuild something great for him. Come on, bro. That we can do something for him. I see the desperation in the prayers, and I go, this is the people striving to be close to God. Man, I've been so proud of the church. These are the kind of prayers that I saw and heard, and it moved me, and amazingly, it's moved God. Wow. Point number one, desperation will make you pray. Wow. You know, if you're not desperate, you're not really praying. If you're not desperate, you don't understand. If in your mind and your heart you're like, oh, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not desperate, I'm cool, man, it's doing good. You do not understand the battle that you were in. You don't understand where God has placed you in history. In 2022, the hope for the nations rests with you, disciple of Jesus Christ. There isn't someone else that's going to do it. If you really understand that, you'll go, I am desperate God do something on my behalf do something in spite of me the walls are torn down this nation is going to hell in a hand basket because the lack of heart of leadership the lack of a love for God it's gone this used to be known as a religious spiritual nation in God we trust our money says that's garbage I don't believe it anymore only true disciples really trust in God come on bro if you're trusted in the United States of America, your life will end. So he says, for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed. And then I said, and he, he, he writes out his prayer so we can read it. O oh Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to, the, and to hear the prayer that your servant is praying before you night day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. One of the things I love about his prayer is he wasn't just praying for himself, he's praying for God's people. Look how he, look how he gets into his prayer. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. He took responsibility. He said, you know, this wall is down because of me. We've sinned. We're the ones I did it. It says we've acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws or you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if you're exiled people at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. You know, some of our prayers need to change. Yeah. When you're praying, oh dear God, Lord Jesus, you're awesome, omniscient, omnipotent, in other words, I don't know how to pronounce, and blah, 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 all those wonderful things. I think God's like, and? Thanks for all that. It's all true. Where's your heart? What are you desperate for? Yes, yes, I'm all powerful. True, God says, of course. But where's your heart to really re rely on me and depend on me? And then he says to God, he says, God, can I just have you remember your word right now? You know, some of our prayers need to be transformed into prayers where we are praying God's word back to him. Say, God, you said this is true. Prove to me you're right. Show me your power. I cannot do it on my own. Amen. I'm desperate, God. Remember your word. 
I'm giving everything I've got to return to you. You scattered us, but please bring us back. That's what your word says, God. Call him on it. He's good for it. Nice. Nice, bro. And it says, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Verse 10, they are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. That was his prayer. A cupbearer, a slave in a foreign country, a man in exile. He sees, and he doesn't see yet, but he hears about what's happened to his city, the city where God's glory is supposed to be seen. And he goes, this can't be. This can't remain like this. God, what can you do? Yeah. And he begs God, and he closed out his prayer by saying, I'm just a cupbearer. Mm. Just a cupbearer. You don't have to be famous to move God's heart. Yeah, bro, that's powerful. You don't have to be somebody special to move God's heart. You just have to have a special relationship with Him. Yeah. He says, God, I'm nothing. I'm just a cupbearer. You know what a cupbearer did? He would taste the wine and the food before the king ate it in case it was poisoned. <laughs> Every day you're like, I oh, hope you don't have any enemies there. <laughs> All good, amen. Yeah. yeah, okay, good. I don't know, I don't know, they wait five minutes, I, I don't know. Is he dead yet? No, he's, okay, let's eat. I mean, this is his role. You taste food for other people, you, you, you drink from the cup. Nobody special. And he begs God to do something miraculous. Bring your glory back to Jerusalem. Use me, God. And then God puts on his heart to go and talk to the king. And so he says, God, give me, give me victory in the presence of this man today. This man can change everything. And this man was a pagan who hated God, had nothing to do with him. And God moves his heart powerfully. I don't have time to read the whole story, but bottom line is God hears his prayer. God moves powerfully. He asks the king, and the king says, yeah, I'll give you whatever you need. Wow. To a cupbearer. Whatever you need. You want to rebuild a city? Great. You know, Proverbs 16, 32 says, if you rule your spirit, you can take a city. See, he did not think of himself in his mind as just a cupbearer. He thought of himself as the one who would be able to bring God's victory back to Jerusalem. If you can have self-control in your mind, you can win a city. You can control that spirit. And for some of us, woo! Not a nice spirit sometimes. But if you can have self-control of your mind and your spirit, you can take a city. You know, we're about to send Austin, Julie, Megan, and several others to Gainesville. Wow. I don't think Austin thinks of himself as, oh, I'm the blind evangelist. Nope. Austin doesn't think of himself like, yes, I'm a guy with disabilities. Nope. Austin thinks of himself as a man who's going to take a city. Come on. Yeah. And you know what? I tend to believe him. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, what they did last night shook the nations. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you got to see the video, but... It was about 6 o'clock, and they set out. And their goal for their region was $48,000. Yeah. And uh, let's just say a couple times this week, there were moments I think Austin felt a little like, bro, oh, I don't know, man. I don't know. But he got a hold of himself, and he, and, he, and he changed his spirit inside of him. Not God's spirit. He can't change that one. He changed his. Come on. Got his mind in line with what God could do. And he says, you know, I'm just a cupbearer. But God, I pray that you would move something powerful. Amen. From 6 until about 8.17, they went after it. And they got to where they only had $1,200 left to raise. Wow. Like, guys, they were almost $10,000 short. Wow. And in, in four hours, they went after it. And you saw the video right at the very end. Austin goes, what did we do, South Region? We made our goal! Yeah. <laughs> Blew it out in four 
hours just working together, one in heart, one in mind, all for God's glory. They get no benefit from this. Nothing to them personally. What would Nehemiah get by rebuilding the wall? Nothing but glory for God. That's why they did it. You know, desperation will make you pray. Point number two, fight like there's no other way. Chapter 2 and verse 11. It says, I went to Jerusalem after staying there three days. I set out during the night with a few men. I did not told anyone what my God had put on my heart to do for Jerusalem. You know, I love this in my communion sharing. I talked about how we don't take boasts for ourselves. Even right now, Nehemiah's going, man, do you know what God's put on my heart? But I ain't telling you. <laughs> He's like, I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to go examine things. I'm going to go check things out. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night I went through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate. I don't know if you ever had your house by the dung gate, you know, but amen. Examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mouth to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I had been doing because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. <laughs> he didn't even tell the guys they are going to be doing the work yet. He just wanted to see the wall first. Like, this what's going on? Let me see. The gates are all gone. Okay. Dung gate. That stinks. Amen. Um, valley gate. Gone. Okay. What do we do? Okay. This gate. Fountain gate. Fountain gate. Beautiful. Amen. Whoops. Gone. And he didn't tell them yet. Verse 17. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. It will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. You know, in the last couple of weeks, I've seen all the fighting. Not fighting each other, amen. Amen. amen but fighting for each other. I saw Muhammad come back one day and he said, you know, I asked someone and they gave me $5,000. I was like, what? What? <laughs> what? You know, there's a post from Jesse and Christina. They went door knocking, just door to door. Hi, how are you? $300 in one day. Isaac posted this morning that he was turning in $3,500 from all the virtual donations. And he simply said in his text, we're going to finish whatever it takes. Come on. The whole campus ministry got together and they went on campus every single day. And they were averaging somewhere between two and $3,000 a day. Wow. And I was like, what? See, you fight like there's no other way. I'm so sorry, sister. I forget how you say your name. Zari? Zari. 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 The most killer cranking message last week. I should have, I should have just let you preach the sermon. She posted, I got $700 unexpected donation, plus $100, plus I gave $200, $1,020 for the Lord. Wow. <laughs> I was like, what? Oh, and by the way, she was baptized on January 23rd. Four months ago, pouring her heart out for the Lord. She already gets it that, hey, fight like there's no other way. Come on. Come on. See, desperation will make you pray, but then you got to fight like there's no other way. So Nehemiah goes, guys, let's go look at the wall. He tells them what they need to do. He didn't even tell them yet that they were going to be the ones working. And he goes, by the way, hope you're inspired. Here's what we're going to do. And, and I love the response. It just simply says, they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. O.J. and Jalisa, yeah. by themselves, raised over $3,600. I, I believe in the raffle alone and other uh, online donations in the Northeast that they did over $35,000 just from that. That doesn't include the personal sacrifice and heart that they gave to rebuild the wall. 
I, I wish I had time to go through all the texts. I just, I read them day after day after day. And let me just tell you something. A couple of times, I just went, it's, it's not enough. And my sinful nature came out. My doubtful, critical, cynical, sinful nature that doesn't trust God, but I trust in myself. And every time I saw it, I was like, no, kill that thing. That's wrong. Man. Come on, man. Let's go, bro. I lost a few battles. And I had a couple moments. Uh, Damien came to me right a few minutes ago. He says, bro, I don't know how you handle all the pressure. I, thought, I started feeling it. Man, this week I felt it. And he was just very open and honest with me. I go, yeah, you know, bro, sometimes I don't handle it. Sometimes I sin. Sometimes I'm just not there. There were times the last couple of weeks I'm like, you know, can we just do something else? Let's just, you know, go play tiddlywinks or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> can we just, like, evangelize my backyard and not worry about the rest of the world? I don't know about you, but I had to go back to what I'm living for and what I'm willing to die for. I had to go back to remember that I've got brothers and sisters in Haiti that we went to go see that have no recourse. They can't, they don't have the place or time to go raise money for themselves. And if you start trying to raise money in Haiti, uh, Haitians, uh, brothers and sisters, what would they say to you? Take a hike. I need money too. It's not that they don't like each other. It's that they're so desperate. And so we're going to raise it for them. Amen. And I remember my family in India. And I go, wait a second. I'm being faithless, I'm being selfish, and I've got to repent, and I had to remember to fight like there's no other way. Amen. And you know, when you begin to fight like that, other people get inspired by what you're doing. Yeah. One of the reasons it's so important that we all talk about the good news of what God is doing, the battles that we face, is so that other people can remember God. Yeah. Yeah. They can remember the victories that He wants to give. Can I ask you a question? Does God want us to be able to get a victory with our special missions? Yeah. Does God want us to get a victory in evangelizing the Metro Miami area? Yeah. Does God want to help you overcome your sin and become a different person? Yeah. Is God on your side or is he against you? Yeah. See, what's amazing is God wants to be on your side. The problem is sometimes we're not on his side. Yeah. And we have to make a decision to fight like there's no other way. Come on. You know, I saw a text... Uh, Jeremy was trying to figure out how to hit his missions, and he made a phone call. $1,000 for the Lord. <laughs> you know, there's some small ones that don't seem to matter in light of those big numbers. Betty posted a family member after 33 years in the kingdom, for the first time ever, gave $100. Okay, so that's... That's amazing. Skip on over to chapter 4. Let's go. Come on, man. Awesome, bro. They start facing more and more and more opposition as they start having a little bit of success. And it's very little. You've got to understand the walls of Jerusalem are two and a half miles long. Two and a half miles. Are you with me? Yeah. It's 40 feet high. And it's very thick. This isn't like a little fence. Got my fence. No, this thing is two and a half miles long. 40 feet high. Why? To keep the enemies out. If you don't rebuild it all the way, you're going to fail. So right here, we find some opposition. In verse 4, he prays again. Remember point number one, desperation will make you pray. And then number two, fight like there's no other way. Yep. Number three, serve till the end of the day. Nice. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them as plunder the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So after his prayer, look what happens, verse 6. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. For the people work with all their hearts. Come on. That, that little section right there blows me away. The more the opposition, the more they prayed. The more the opposition, the more they fought. 
The more they were tired, the more they kept on serving. They rebuilt the wall till 20 feet high. Now the enemies of God are getting super intense. They really come after them. The people start doing crazy things like threatening them, trying to hire other people to take them out, accusing them against the king who had given them the wood, the lumber and everything and the freedom to go and rebuild it. Verse 19, chapter 4. I'm sorry, let's pick it up in verse 16. Like I said, verse 15, when our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. So the plans of the enemies got frustrated because they had been praying and working with all their hearts. And it says, verse 16, from that day on, half my men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did the work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore a sword on his side as he worked, but the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. See, they had a plan. You want victory? You get a plan. You got opposition? You better get some weapons. You better figure out how to fight with one arm tied behind your back. Come on, bro. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated. Remember, it's two and a half miles long. We're widely separated from each other along the wall. Whenever you hear, wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there or God will fight for us. Nice. They were ready. They were not going to stop the rebuilding of the wall. They were going to kill themselves if that's what it took. Because this was for God's honor. It wasn't for them. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and workmen by day. So they were working day and night. Awesome. What a heart. Verse 23, neither I nor my brothers, nor my men, nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon, even when he went for water. Mm -hmm. Powerful. Point number three, serve till the end of the day. You know, when I heard the story of the South region just going for it, I thought this, this is the heart that we need to emulate in the Metro Miami Church from day and night. You know, I talked to uh, all the brothers during the week. How's it going, bro? And the first thing almost all of them says, yeah, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm, I'm tired. I said, what are you going to do today? I'm in the battle, bro. We're going for it. Going to rally the people again. We're going to do it again. And then during the day, I'd check on them. How you doing? I'm tired, bro. <laughs> but I'm fired up. And they just kept going and going and going. They served till the end of the day. You know, if you want a victory for God, the question you have to ask yourself is, what are you willing to do? Jesus says, unless you give up Everything you have, you cannot be my disciple. And a disciple in the scriptures is the same as a Christian. Yeah. A Christian is someone who is saved. Someone who is saved is a worker for the Lord. Someone who is saved is a worker, is a Christian, that's a disciple. Yeah. That's what disciples do. That's who we are by sheer definition. If that's not how you're living, I would argue you're not a disciple. At the very least, you're flailing in your relationship with God. And today's the day to call you back. It is time for us to have a heart to serve till the end of the day. Amen. You know, it says in verse 6 here, so we rebuilt the wall till it reached half its height. Point number four, half its height won't keep the enemies at bay. It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. They come after him again. There's further opposition. Chapter 5, chapter 6. Now there's letters being written. They're trying to discourage them. Every time they turn around, there's someone else trying to take them out. So half its height isn't enough. You know, last week I got a report. The special missions, we were halfway there. We had 150,000 raised. Guys, that was one week ago. And I went, gulp. <laughs> okay. Amen. Amen. 
had a little, you know, nerves in my knees. I was like, okay. You know, your, your enemies show up when you build halfway, and they're just going to run over you. Well, we got a half a victory for God. I halfway repented of my sins. I halfway got baptized. Jesus is half my Lord. I just take care of all the rest. It's me, you know. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And we need to make a decision that we're not going to quit halfway when it comes to changing as a church. When it comes to growing as a church. When it comes to winning victories as a church, we're not going to stop halfway. What a victory to get halfway, amen? What a joy to get halfway. It gives you hope you only have halfway to go. Right? Cup half full or half empty. I don't know how you look at it. I try to think half full. Try to. Sometimes they go, empty, <laughs> empty. What <are> t- <laughs> empty. Can you imagine some of the enemies walking around, ah, it's only half its height. And they even, they even one point said, even if a fox jumped on it, it would knock it down. Wow. And I can imagine at that moment, the Israelites that are rebuilding are kind of check, second guessing themselves going, will a fox knock it down? <laughs> this is burnt wood and burnt stones, but I don't know. One hand on the sword, the other hand putting rocks in. Well, we're halfway. I don't know if back then they said cup half empty or half full. But I bet they said uh, wall half (laughs) built. (laughs) Or wall almost built, right? I don't know. Where are you today when it comes to helping someone become a disciple? Are you halfway there? Are you giving half your heart in anything that you do? I love the fact that multiple times it says the people worked with all their heart. Amen, brother. You know what I found? Even when I work with all my heart, the job doesn't get done. And I'm like, God, God, I don't don't get it. I worked with all my heart. I gave everything I had. There were multiple times this week. I'm like, God, the people are giving everything they've got, but we're just barely halfway there. God, please. I begged him. So many times I prayed, not knowing what he would do, not knowing what would happen. But I kept thinking, you know, these people have worked with all their heart. God, do the rest. We're not going to get out of this without a victory. I'm begging you, God. And I know many of you are saying the same prayer. I believe that's the prayer we have to have. In chapter 6, and verse 15, after all the opposition, the Bible simply says the wall was completed. On the 25th of Elul, In 52 days, when all our enemies, guys, two and a half miles, 40 feet high, finished in 52 days. This was not a movement of man. It was the movement of God. God did the rest. Can you imagine these people, a couple of hundred people were actually doing the building. The rest were out there trying to keep the enemies away. And in, in, in 52 days, this is impossible. That's just crazy. Without the help of God, it wouldn't have been done. Verse 16, when all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized this work had been done with the help of our God. Nice. Wow. You know, I want to show you a couple of pictures, if we could project them up here. Kip McKean became a disciple and. In the 1800s. Well, he's not here. He's not going to hear me say that. Actually, uh, became a disciple in 1972, 50 years ago. At 17 years old, he began praying for his family, his mom in particular. And uh, the last couple of months, Kip has been going to Orlando week after week after week. Just praying for his mom and all of us around the world praying, dear God, be with Kim. Kim's a young, spry 93. And uh, she's as sharp as ever. Uh, She blows me away. And Kip had texted all of us, hey, she did seeking God. She loved it. She did the word. And she's still going after it. She did discipleship. It got a little sketchy. But she got through it. Then she did the kingdom of God. And then Kip and Elena, along with Martin and Carmen, did light and darkness with mom. Oh, you know? <laughs> Yoo-hoo! 
<laughs> 93 years of sin. Amen. Don't tell Kim I said that. Um, and, and, then, and then they did the church study. And they had to work on some unity issues and try to figure out what does this really mean? And on Saturday morning, Kim McKean was baptized as your sister in Christ. Let's go to the next. Is there another picture? There we go. The kid got to baptize his mom after 50 years. Let's go one more. There's Elena with uh, Kim and just giving her a Bible. Uh, and then there's uh, Martin and Carmen with them. Um, what a victory. And there's a family friend, a doctor that was there with them. And they got to see the baptism as well. You know, point number five, fight for your family and watch the water spray. <laughs> you know, the title of the lesson today is simple. It's just fight for your family. How do you fight for your family? You got to remember desperation will make you pray. You got to remember that you got to fight like there's no other way. You got to have the heart to serve till the end of the day. You got to remember... Half its height will not keep the enemies at bay, but rather fight for your, fam fight for your family and watch the water spray. Nice. Guys, let's have a heart today, no matter what happens, to keep having a conviction that we're going to fight for your family. I love you guys. Amen. Yeah.